teach karate. That's my part. You promise learn. I say you do. No question. That's your part. Deal? Steal? Yes. First wash all the car, then wax. Wax. Wait, why do I have to wash all the car? Remember, dear, no question. Yeah, but I... Right. <laughs> wax on, right hand. Wax off, left hand. Wax on, wax off. Breathe in through nose, out the mouth. Wax on, wax off. Don't forget to breathe. Very important. Wax on, wax off. Wax on, wax off. Hey, where these cars come from? Wax on. Detroit! Wax off. Wax on, wax off. Okay, for those of you under the age of 30, that's the real Karate Kid. You didn't know that. You thought it was Will Smith's kid. It's not. That was the real Karate Kid. Hey, uh, good to have you guys. We are starting the series today called Breakaway. My name's Dave. We've never met. I'm the lead pastor here. And uh, just like Daniel with Mr. Miyagi, he didn't quite have an understanding of what he was getting into, what it really was going to mean to be Mr. Miyagi's student. I think a lot of us sometimes have a, a misunderstanding of what it really means to be a Christian, to be a follower of Jesus. We're starting this series today. It's going to take us to the end of the summer called Breakaway, breaking free from the mistakes the messes and the mindsets that often hold us back in life. And I think one of the most detrimental mindsets that we can have is those, those of us who, who come to church and we're, maybe we're followers of Jesus already or we're kind of seeking it out. We're trying to figure out, do I want this to be a part of my life? Do I want this to be kind of what drives me and what I center everything around? Or do I just want it to be sort of a, you know, one aspect? Or I just do the church thing because it's the right thing to do? Wherever you're at on that, it doesn't matter. I think one of the most troubling mindsets, one of the most detrimental mindsets that we can have is the wrong mindset about what it means to be a Christian. Because I think from my experience, I went through this personally in my own walk of faith, but I just know this from talking to a lot of people, that what you've heard it means to be a Christian is probably wrong. I know that may sound judgmental, may sound, oh, what, what's his soapbox, what, but just, in my experience, I'm just being real with you, that's what I've found. And it's one of those mindsets, if we've got the wrong mindset about what it means to be a Christian, we could be held back in life. We could certainly be held back in terms of our faith. If you want to be a person who, who grows in faith, who knows God, who makes a relationship with him the center of, of who you are. You've heard that being a Christian, and I've heard it too, means that you belong to a church. It's a great thing to belong to a church. Just like you guys are coming to this church, that's awesome. That's not what it means to be a Christian. You've heard what it means to be a Christian is to follow a certain set of rules, to believe a certain set of doctrines or, or statements about this is who is God and this is what it's all about, and that's all important too. You've heard that it, it means to um, follow a certain set of traditions. And again, if, if approached in, a, in the right way, in a healthy way, all those things are very important, very helpful. But none of them, none of them are the definition of what it means to be a Christian. And here's why this is so important. Here's why this is absolutely critical, because if you're seeking out Christ, if you're trying to figure out, do I want to be a religious person? Do I want to have God in my life? Do I want to do the church thing and have it you know, be significant? You need to know what you're getting into. You need to have accurate information as to what Christianity is really about. Because the other reason why this is so important is because once you become a Christian, once you say, yeah, I'm in, or I'm going to do the church thing, or I'm a follower of Jesus, and that's a part of my life, you've made that decision in some way, shape, or form. You want it to be meaningful. You want it to change you. You want it to have purpose. See, I grew up going to church. But for years, now in hindsight, I realized I never understood for so many years what it meant to be a Christian, and it was absolutely meaningless to me. In fact, as a teenager, I walked away, and I thought genuinely, I'll never go back. I'll never go back, because it, it has no meaning for my life. That's why it's so critical you and I understand what it really means to be a Christian, because we've got the wrong mindset on this, Again, it just won't have any true meaning or purpose for our lives and we'll eventually, we'll eventually walk away. Now, the Bible gives us a lot of different stories, particularly around the person of Jesus himself, which would make sense, about what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And we're going to look at one of those today. 
But before we do, I think we need to understand a little bit about it. If you go back in Jesus' day, 2,000 years ago, and you put yourself in the context in which he lived, in which he ministered, in which he did his thing as a human being here on earth, to be a follower of someone back then was very different than what you and I would think of today as being a follower of someone. We think of it today as more of a student-teacher relationship, right? Here's, here's a, a leader or a teacher or someone of, of some importance or someone I look up to, and I want to know what they know. Or maybe to go a step further, I want to be associated with what they associate themselves with. And that's fine. We need those types of relationships in our lives, absolutely. As long as they're with the right types of leaders, of course. But in Jesus' day, that's not what it meant to be a follower, the word that was used back then, a disciple of someone else. See, our thinking is, I just want to know what my teacher knows. I want to know what that leader knows, be associated with what they do, what they stand for. In Jesus' day, the mindset was, and again, it was particular to, the the best example was a a disciple and his rabbi. I don't want to simply know what my rabbi knows. I want to be what my rabbi is. Don't miss that. I don't don't want to simply know what my rabbi knows. I want to be what my rabbi is. In other words, I want to think like they think. I want to act like they act. I want to pray like they pray. I want to relate to people the way I see my rabbi relating to people. I I don't want to just know what they know. I don't want to just be part of their thing. I want to actually be who they are. And with that context, with that understanding of what it meant to follow someone back in Jesus' day, this story we're going to look at, which you all know, and you don't have to be, I'm not, I'm not assuming you're a Christian by saying that, okay? I don't want to insult you if you're like, hey, I'm not a Christian yet. Wait, don't put the, Everyone knows this story to some degree or another. It's just one of those famous Jesus stories that you don't have to be a church person or a churchgoer or, or a Christian or any of that to know this story. But when you understand what it meant in Jesus' day to follow someone, this story, whether you've heard it for years or you just kind of heard it in a cultural reference or something, this story takes on whole new meaning. And so that's what I'm going to look at today. It's found in Matthew f- chapter 14. Verse 22, this is, this is just one of those stories of Jesus and his guys, his followers. And we get these incredible, by people who were there, we get this incredible insight into what happened in these different situations. In this one particular uh, case story, verse 22 in Matthew 14, it says, immediately Jesus made the disciples, they were out doing their thing, ministering, hanging out, made the disciples, his followers, get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side, meaning the other side of the lake, while he dismissed the crowd. Now, right off the bat, remember, again, a a, a student or, or excuse me, a follower, a disciple, doesn't want to just know what his rabbi knows. He wants to be what his rabbi is. In order to really be like someone else, you've got to be with them, like, as much as you can. It it can't just be like an hour here, and we schedule a three-hour appointment here, then maybe once a year we'll do a retreat together. You've got to be with that person as much as humanly possible. So Jesus had to literally dismiss his disciples, you guys need to go away from me for a little bit, right? Jesus needs his alone time kind of thing, right? We, it's like what you do with your, ki- parent or your kids at certain points. or other, you just, <laughs> Daddy needs his alone time. Jesus would have to do that because his disciples always wanted to be with him because they didn't want to just know what he knew. They wanted to be who he was. That's what it meant to be a disciple. So the only time you ever see Jesus alone, and if you've read the New Testament before, and you specifically the stories of Jesus, and you've, this has caught your mind, th- this is why. The only time you ever see Jesus alone is when he's praying, so when he's talking to God, that'd be like, the, okay, you know what, guys? I just, I've got to have that time. I've got to be able to hear God's voice. I've got to be able to re- relate with him. Of course, in Jesus' humanity, he was God too. But in his humanity, he'd say, you know, you've got to give me this time. That's the only time you ever saw Jesus alone was when he was praying. He'd literally, he'd have to admit, this was such a big deal. His followers, I've got to be with you. I've got to be with you. I've got to be with you. He would dismiss them, say, no, you, you need to go. Get in the boat. Go across the other side of the lake. I need some time with God. But that's how, that's how much they want to to be right there. So that's the setup to this story. Keeps going. After he dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. We already talked about that. Later that night, he was there alone. And the boat, which the disciples were in, was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. So the implication here is that a storm kind of arose on the lake. Jesus is on the, back on land praying. And the disciples are having to fight this storm. And one of the reasons we know that is um, in another translation, if you really get into a translation that digs into the the original Greek and kind of pulls that out, um, it says, by the fourth watch of the night, the disciples were kind of rowing and and doing their thing. The fourth watch of the night would have been about 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. Well, this all started back in evening the day before. 
So here's the thing, we don't know this for sure, but the implication is the disciples are out there on the boat fighting a storm like all night long. And just put yourself in that situation. If you're in that place, you're fighting a storm, you can't sleep, you're tired, you're probably really hungry, what happens to you in those sorts of situations? You get irritable, you get frustrated, no one's your friend, right? And you certainly don't want to be a follower of someone at that point. You're just like, this life is now about me. We've all been there in some way or another. These, that's what the disciples were going through. And Jesus saw it all. He knew it all. He's, still, he's praying. But all throughout the night, likely this is what his followers, his disciples, those who wanted to be like him, what he was, were going through out in the boat. So let's see what happens next. Shortly before dawn, again, kind of referencing how long this ordeal was for his followers, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. Something only Jesus could do. Right? That's humanly impossible. You have to have some kind of God thing going on to walk on a lake. Now, if you believe Jesus is the Son of God, that's not a big deal, right? That's not amazing. That's not, if, he really, if he's God in the flesh... No big deal. But the point is, it was something only he could do. It was something only, someone, someone who was in touch with God in some way or another, who was God himself, who knows, but there had to be something divine, something supernatural going on for a person to walk on water. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. Before, you and I would do this too, all right? You would be freaked out, and I would too. If we really sit back, we look at it in 21st century with just nice, pleasant church eyes or whatever and say, oh my gosh, they were terrified? Why? I, that's so, you know, a guy's walking to you on the lake. Yeah, you just spent like every waking hour with this guy, but now he's walking to you on the lake. They were terrified, and they figured, this is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But then this is how Jesus responds. Immediately, he says to them, take courage. It's I. Don't be afraid. He knows they'd be freaked out. He knows they'd be like, I've never seen a person walking on water before. That's really weird. And I think they're thinking the same thing. Well, something supernatural has got to be going on, so maybe it's a ghost. Jesus doesn't scold them. Jesus doesn't slap them around a little bit. Jesus doesn't say, you're off my team. He just take courage. It's me. It's me. I know you're freaked out because only I can do this sort of thing. That's just, just who I am, but don't worry. Everything's going to be okay because it's me. It's your rabbi. And then Peter, one of the 12, says, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you on the water. Just think about it. Just put yourself in Peter's shoes just for a moment. Lord, if it's you, Tell me to come to you on the water. What was Peter thinking? Oh, yeah, Jesus can walk on the water, but you've got to be Jesus to do that. Lord, 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 if it's you, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. And then the word that it just, this is just one of the most beautiful Jesus words, and he says it all the time. Come. Yeah, everyone's freaked out. And yeah, I know this is only something that I can do. But Peter, you come. Not, <laughs> that's silly, Peter. Come on, you're a human being. I've got the whole God-man thing going on. It's just, you know. No. Come to me. And then Peter got down out of the water. Walked on the water. Walked on the water. The first part about Jesus walking the water shouldn't amaze us. This part should. Peter got out of the boat, walked on the water, the Bible tells us, and came toward Jesus. A disciple just doesn't want to know what his rabbi knows. A disciple, remember, wants to be what his rabbi is. And then some of you, actually all of you probably know this part of the story, but when he saw the wind, remember the storm's still going here. This has gone throughout all the night. He was afraid and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Lord, save me. To which you and I say, well, Peter, why are you losing your faith in Jesus? And we'll come back to this, but here, just, just to put a little thought in your head. 
I don't think Peter's faith in Jesus was shaken at all during this. I don't think this had anything to do with his faith in Jesus. But let's finish the story. But when he, oh, excuse me. Let me read that again just so I remember, Andy, where I'm at. Thank you. But when he saw the wind, that was my fault, sorry. He was afraid and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. And then, again, you guys know the punchline. You've heard this before. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? Remember, a follower doesn't simply want, a disciple doesn't simply want to know what his rabbi knows. He wants to be what his rabbi is. But Jesus was not an ordinary rabbi. And that night on the boat, his disciples learned something about what it means to follow Jesus, what it means to be his disciple that would forever change them as people, would forever change them is what we would come to know as Christians. And it's this, that true Christianity, true Christianity, you guys, we think it's rules, we think it's traditions, we think it's a set of beliefs. True Christianity requires getting out of the boat because Jesus walks on water and you can do no less. True Christianity. True Christianity means getting out of the boat and walking on water because your rabbi, that's what he does. In other words, a follower can't do anything less. A follower wants to be what his rabbi is. See, again, we think Peter lost faith in Jesus. I don't think Peter lost faith in Jesus. Jesus was still the one standing on the water. If you were in Peter's shoes, think about it. You're not going to lose faith in Jesus. He's not sinking. Peter lost faith in the fact that he could be like Jesus. Peter lost faith at the, in, in the whole idea that discipleship meant to be what your rabbi was. And he was the only one, though, that got out of the boat. But he started to wonder. He started to doubt. He saw the wind. He saw the waves. Oh, boy, maybe I'm not cut out for this. Oh, boy, maybe, I, maybe, this, maybe I'm not good enough for this. Maybe it's not in me. I don't know how this works. And he started to sink. But he was the only one who got out of the boat. Just think about this for a second. How badly would you have to want to be like Jesus to get out of that boat? Storms raging, winds coming, the waves are starting to come. You've been fighting all night long. You're tired, you're hungry. How badly would you want to be like your rabbi if you were to get out of the boat and attempt to walk to him on water? It's not a wonder why Jesus picked Peter to be a leader among leaders when he left the earth and the whole Christian church thing started. I mean, some of us look at the story of Peter, and if you know it, you kind of have read some things here and there that he was a goof up and he was impulsive and all these and all that stuff was true. You can make an argument that he was a, the biggest screw up of the bunch, which I like because that's how I feel oftentimes. Yet Jesus says, this is, my, this is my leader among leaders. I think Jesus looked at Peter and saw, this is, a guy, this is someone who wants to be like me so badly, he'd be willing to go anywhere with me. He'd be willing to do anything to be like me. He'd get out of a boat, something humanly impossible, and walk on the water. Now, I am not suggesting anyone go get out on a boat and go try to walk on water. There's only two times that we know of where that is what it meant to be like Jesus. We read them both in the Bible. So unless you ever have Jesus show up in human form on a lake and you're out fishing and he says, come, don't get out of a boat and try to walk on water. It's not going to work. But it does mean that Jesus calls us, for those of us who want to know him, to follow him, and he says, be like me. Go where I go. Love like I love. Forgive like I forgive. Show mercy like I show mercy. Love the unlovely. Hurt with the hurting. On and on, all the things that are the essence of who Jesus is and what he does, he says to you and me, if we want to be his followers, this is what it means to be a Christian. This is what it means to be my follower. And the list just goes on and on and on. And that's why we get together on Sunday mornings. That's why we come to churches, so we can help each other understand, remind each other what it means to be like Jesus. And then go out and do the real work of discipleship, the real work of following Christ, Monday through Saturday. Being like him with others. That's, that's what we do here. Our mission, in fact, as a church, for some of you know it, but maybe you've never heard it, is to help people know and become like Jesus. Because that, 
That's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. That's what it means, literally, to be a Christian. Now, if you're sitting here and you hear all this and you think, wow, okay, that's great, and maybe I've never heard that before, and that's kind of new, but I don't, I don't think that's for me. I don't think I want to be a Christian. I don't think I've got the background to really be a Christian. I don't think I've got the right qualifications. I don't feel like I'm smart enough. I don't feel like I'm brave enough. All these, oh, there's so many things. We can hear something like that and say, wow, that's really interesting. Wow, that's cool. Even maybe, wow, that makes sense. But I'm not sure that's for me. Here's what you need to know. Back in Jesus' day, another thing about discipleship is when it came to the typical rabbi, the typical Jewish rabbi, it was very hard to become a follower. Some of you, it, it would kind of match some of your expectations. Some of you think, oh man, to be like that, to live like that, to be one of those people that goes anywhere with Jesus and truly becomes like him, that's got to be like a select few, right? Well, for most, most rabbis and disciples, it was. In fact, you had to be the best, the brightest, the smartest. You had to pass all the tests. I mean, you literally were like in the top 1% or maybe half a percent of the 1% or whatever in order to be a follower, a disciple of a rabbi. But Jesus wasn't, again, the typical rabbi. Jesus looked at everyone and said, come, come, come. And every time he said come, he was saying, I think you can be like me. I think you can love like I love. I think you can live and relate to people the way I live and relate to people. I think you can forgive like I forgive. Come and be like me. He called A students and D students. He called people that were so unlovable and Totally the big huggy Monticellus types where you're just like, man, I just want to be with this guy. Just like, just hold on to him. And everything in between. He called those people that were so smart and just so clever and so just wickedly gifted and yet they were just that wicked. And no one wanted to be around. He called those people too. He said, come and be like me. There, were no, there was nothing that disqualified you from Jesus looking at you and saying, I think you can be like me. When I was a kid, I, I loved to play basketball. Love, love basketball is my, my favorite sport. And um, for a long time, uh, you know, in my growing up years, I thought I had the dream I would go and pro play professional basketball. Now, if you've ever played basketball with me, you're like, wow, really? You were off, Dave. That was, uh, but I, there was a time in my life where I thought that, that is what I'm going to do. In fact, for those of you, if you have any advice on this, my, my wife and I are going through that period right now with our kids where we're trying to always be 100% truthful and honest with them, but never squash their dreams at the same time. That is so hard to do, right? So now when, I, you know, when my son says, and he still believes with all his heart he's going to play professional sports someday, I tell him, you can do it. You can absolutely do it, but you're going to have to work harder than every other kid for like a 10-mile radius to even have a chance, son. And if you want to go for it, I'll help you. But I, but I don't want to tell him you can't do it. I don't want to tell him it's impossible, right? But anyway, so I was, I was at that stage where I thought that's what I would do. And then I, I eventually realized, no, I just won't be good enough. Maybe it's a combination of skill or, or natural talent and, you know, my height and just, you know, um, lack of work ethic leading up to that. Who knows? But whatever it is, I came to the conclusion and said, you know what, that's not going to be for me. But just imagine, just imagine all of a sudden in the midst of kind of wrestling with that, and this is, it dates me, but this is just who I looked up to back then. Thank goodness there was no social media back then. Michael Jordan pulls up in a limo. And he just, he, he sees me at my house and I'm shooting hoops or whatnot. He says, hey kid, you know what, I've been watching you. I think you can be like me. I'd be like, are you kidding me? Really? I was just about to write myself off. So yeah, you come hang out with me. You go to my facility in Chicago. We'll train. We'll play. I'll, 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 I'll get you up. But trust me, it is in you. I believe you can be just like me. You'll be the next MJ. Let's do this thing. For, you know, after they woke me up because I'd passed out and all that kind of stuff, I, you'd go for it. You'd do it in a split second. You'd be like, oh my gosh. This is like who I, if I could pick someone to be, this is who I want to be, and they're saying I could be like them. That's exactly what it was for Jesus to come to someone, whether it was 2,000 years ago or you and I today, and say, come, follow me, be like me. You say, no, no, no wait, I, Jesus, I'm sorry, but I am not the religious type. I don't care, come. I want you to be like me. Yeah, but I, you know, I, have you seen, like, I know you're God, so you can kind of watch the whole eternal videotape thing. Have you seen the things I've done? Or did you see what happened to me when I was in the third grade? Or did you see, or have you looked into my heart and seen this guy? I don't care, come. Come. I think you can be like me. Because when God is with you and his power is working inside you, and you have a relationship with him, you can be just like Jesus. You can go where he goes. You can love like he loves. You can 
make a difference in the world the way he made a difference in the world because that's what it means to be a follower. And Jesus doesn't exclude anyone. All of us are qualified. All of us are invited. And just imagine for a minute, you guys, just imagine if we caught hold of this vision of what it means to be a Christian. Just imagine for a moment if we said, you know what, yeah, rules are important, but it's not about the rules. Yeah, having the right beliefs, right, understand what the Bible says about who God is and how we know him, that's extremely important. But that's ultimately not what it means to be a Christian either. Yeah, traditions are great, and traditions should be there, and all that, but ultimately, following a bunch of traditions, that's not what it means to be a Christian. If we, imagine if we could catch hold of a vision, that to, the vision that to be a Christian, to be a follower of Christ, is to be like him. Imagine what would happen in our workplaces, in our communities, in our schools, in our homes, in your marriage, with your kids. Just imagine what would happen if we had the right mindset about what it means to be a Christian. And we believe, we truly believe with all our heart that Jesus says to me and to you and every single one of us, you can be like me. Everything would change. Everything would change. And that's what Christianity is. It's not just, I just want to, well, I just want to know what the Bible says, or I just want to be associated with that church, or I just want to do that thing, or I just want to feel better about myself, so I'll do. A follower of Jesus just doesn't want to just be associated with Jesus or know what Jesus knows. He wants to be who Jesus is. And so there's one thing, one thing only that I want you to do this week. And if there's something you want to sign up for on your card or have us pray about, absolutely, keep letting us know that kind of stuff. But just when you walk away from this message, I just want you to do one thing. I want you to wrestle with the mindset of what it means to be a Christian. I want you to go home and say, have I believed Christianity is something it's not? Have I missed it? Whether you're totally new to faith and you're just looking into it, or you've been a Christian for years. Because if we can let God fix this part, this mindset, it opens up the floodgates for so much else, so much more. And so go home this week. Just one thing I ask you to do, one thing I encourage you to do. What is my belief? What do I think it means to be a Christian? Again, it's not just to know what your rabbi knows. It's to be who, be what your rabbi is. Jesus I want to be like you. Father, I, I pray today in this moment that everyone here, even if they're not ready to take that step of faith yet, that everyone here would know. Everyone here would walk out of this building today understanding what it means to be a follower of Jesus. God, not that the other things are bad. Father, help us not throw those things out. We need to learn to walk in obedience and do the things you say. We need to have traditions and things that help us understand who you are and what role the church plays in our life. We need all those things. We need proper theology and proper doctrine, but God, at the end of the day, help us to know that to be a Christian, to be your follower, means to become like you. Father, for the person we need to extend grace to, help us do that. For the person we need to forgive, help us to forgive. For the person, God, who we just need to shine your light to and reach out to and show love to, help us to do those things. God, for the places in our life where we need to put up boundaries and be healthy, which you certainly did, Jesus, help us to do that as well. I don't know what it is for everyone, God, but I do know you want us to be like you. You've called every one of us. You've said no matter where we're at, no matter what we've come from and come through, you want us to follow you, and that means you want us to be like you in this world. So Jesus, help us have that kind of mindset. Help us ultimately to break free from the wrong sort of mindset. God, that we might go out into this world now and love and live the way you loved and lived. So God, do something special in each of us this morning. Meet us right where we're at and help us to walk away wanting more and more, more than ever before, to be like you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.
matters.